What's happening, folks? My name is John Lovell, Warrior Poet Society, and I want to let you know this last weekend in one of our Warrior Poet Rifle classes down in Florida, one of our students just collapsed on the range. Seemed good, seemed healthy, no big issue, ran a drill, and then just fell over and went into cardiac arrest. We're going to talk about what happened, what we did about it, and what we're doing going forward. Because I believe as people are just inexplicably dropping like flies, I personally know some folks that have died and fallen out this same kind of thing without really any warning. It means I need to up the ante as somebody who is carrying medical and somebody who is medically trained. I do, and you do as well if you want to safeguard life in the good warrior poet way. Let's get into it. All right, so Paul, you had a uh, eventful weekend in Florida. It was more than uh, a normal training event often uh, offers us, right? So we did have a student unexpectedly collapse after running a rifle drill in our rifle three class on Friday. And uh, yeah, and then we kicked into action our medical plan that we brief. Uh, we went right into it and uh, we were able to save this guy. So, so, you know, did he have prior medical stuff? As I understand, he was one of my former students. He was a current student of yours, obviously, but... Was there any indication? Did, did he have something pre-existing? Or? Nothing that we could see uh, and nothing we found out uh, subsequent to the event. He was a pretty healthy looking 60 year old male uh, and was, you know, no kind of, uh, he wasn't, carrying, wasn't carrying around a lot of extra weight. Uh, he was handling all the drills and the training very well. Uh, there was nothing to indicate that this was something that was going to happen. This wasn't a student where I was watching kind of like, hey, uh, keep an eye on this guy. Maybe, uh, you know, he might have some health issues that uh, that could come into play later. But no, nothing to indicate that uh, that we'd have an event with this guy for sure. All right. So ran he ran the drill and it was at the end of that rifle three drill where... What so, happened? Yeah, so he completed the drill. He was actually behind the firing line. Uh, I was watching the range. I was looking down range. He was up range of me when it happened. And basically, from uh, from what our, from what the guys told us that were there, because there were we were running basically like a man on man drill. So there were uh, several students kind of uh, grouped together back at the uh, behind the firing line where he was when he collapsed. So several of the students saw him collapse. Uh, he went down uh, kind of slowly. Uh, dropped to the ground. It wasn't just a, you know, puppet strings cut kind of thing uh, like I've seen guys do before uh, who have fainted or due to dehydration, that kind of thing. He went down kind of slow, like almost like he knew it was coming, but he was not communicative. Uh, he hit the ground and he started seizing almost immediately when he hit the ground, uh, which I would imagine is probably as a result of him going into cardiac arrest. So as he was seizing, uh, our two medical professionals, basically, of course, I called ceasefire on the range. And as per our medical brief, I went straight to my vehicle to get my cell phone. and was on the phone with 911 dispatchers while, while our primary uh, our primary and secondary medics were working on him. And those were the medics. They, they were just students in the class that happened to have prior medical, right? So we had, uh, we had one uh, student in the class that we had designated as our primary kind of range medic. He was a trauma nurse, uh, also has some uh, TCCC training. And then... Was that Ian? Uh, it was. It was Ian. Yeah. Right, right, right. So uh, Ian was our primary first responder. He was actually in the middle of running the drill, uh, called a ceasefire. Uh, the guys got his attention. He dumped his rifle, moved immediately to the patients. Sam, uh, our, one of our other instructors, Sam Houston, uh, he went right to the patient as well. And so we had several guys on him very quickly. Right. And I, I could hear in the background as I'm trying to get 911 on the phone, I heard him say, I heard somebody say, hey, let's try and roll him into recovery position. Yep. Uh, they had tried to roll him into recovery position. He was still, he, it seemed like he was still possibly seizing at that point. I kind of like moved up so I could get eyes on him a little bit. And then as I walked away, when 911 answered the phone, I walked away to get away from the noise so I could communicate effectively with 911 dispatchers. Then I heard something about not having, uh, not having a pulse, no breathing. Mm -hmm. And I heard starting CPR. So this guy had no breathing, no pulse, uh, and they went immediately into chest compressions. They had busted out during, chest, during uh, Ian was actually administering chest compressions. They busted out a BVM, a, a back valve mask for those who don't know. Uh, to administer the rescue breaths as necessary. And at, uh, after about two minutes of CPR, this is where it gets kind of interesting. Uh, about a minute and a half, two minutes of CPR, they realized that uh, they probably needed to get an AED on this guy and shock him. Where do you find one of those? What did you do? Right. So, um, you know, as you said, AEDs are pretty much, I mean, they're, they're almost universal these days, right? In uh, kind of normal, um, I, I guess, uh, 
office buildings have them now. Yeah. You find them all over the airports, right? right. Anywhere you've got uh, large groups of people, you find AEDs hanging on the walls, clearly marked. Uh, downtown area where I live, they have them hanging up on, like, they've got them fixed outside of buildings. Wow. Right. So uh, and, and again, clearly marked. And of course, AEDs are pretty um, they, they talk you through the entire process. Right. There doesn't it, there's not a whole lot of extra training required for this. But anyway, uh, we were in not a, saying you should get it and not have any training. Correct. By the way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we're in a pretty remote area. Right. As it turns out, they don't generally build outdoor ranges in major metropolitan areas. <laughs> so we're generally in kind of remote areas where uh, first responders are a little further out than in kind of normal suburban and urban environments. We knew that the ambulance from the range owner, we knew that the ambulance response time is going to be about 30 minutes right, yeah. from the time they launch, yeah. which is you that's might, a long time. Yeah. Right? Forget the ambulance. Just send a hearse. Absolutely. Yeah. So. Um, Two of our students, one of which was actually working on the patient, was actually managing airway while uh, Ian was administering chest compressions. He and his friend who had come to class, they travel everywhere with an AED. Uh, he's a former paramedic. Um, in a past life, he was a paramedic, and he carries an AED with him all of the time, even in a rental car. So, wow. When this, ev yeah, when this event transpired, though, these guys, right, it's always a, a cascade of events, right, unfortunate circumstances sometimes, uh, but with a happy outcome, they were trying to get AAA on the phone to unlock their vehicle. Somehow, unfamiliar rental car, they had managed to lock the keys in the vehicle. So the AED is locked in the vehicle. And we had to uh, use some extraction tools to uh, open the vehicle. Sam was able to get an axe out of his vehicle. He carries some recovery tools with him and broke the window to get the AED out. Now, we have a small, you know, two, uh, basically a mini sledgehammer in the range, uh, in the range trailer and a hand axe, but Sam is extra and often dramatic. And so went for the full size axe for right. breaking the window. Yeah. And I'm sure it's something he's always wanted to do. Yep. So he like uh, took off his shirt first and of painted course, his face. Of course, absolutely. So, uh, we were able to, uh, to get, they get the AED out, they hook it up. The AED does a diagnosis. And again, I'm kind of, I'm off to the side trying to deal with 911 dispatchers. Of course, the initial one has to transfer me over to somebody that's closer to the local area where we are, that kind of thing. Uh, I haven't had to call 911, uh, and actually deal deal with first responder dispatchers in a long time and it was it it is it can be kind of frustrating uh even when you're delivering very concise information about what you need and the sort of assets you're requesting based on the situation and the assessment of the first responders on scene it's very difficult sometimes to get things moving as fast as you want them to so we took trauma shears cut his shirt off so we could get, get good skin contact with the pads for the AED. The AED will do an assessment of the patient and recommend shock or not. The AED recommended shock. So uh, everybody cleared. They hit him with the AED. They shocked him one time and then went right back into chest compressions again. So another minute to two minutes of chest compressions go on. AED recommends another shock. They give him another shock. And I'm just about to kind of close out, I hope, my conversation with the dispatchers who are going to get uh, assets rolling toward us and patient regains consciousness he comes back eyelids start fluttering and he's not he's not initially communicative he's kind of coming out of a fog and the guys are kind of they're talking to him they're saying his name and trying to get him to uh to respond and eventually he kind of comes out of it and he has no idea where he is he doesn't know who he is but uh, he was very confused, obviously, kind of had a big, his body took a big, uh, a big shock, literally and figuratively. So he's dealing with kind of recovering from this thing. And uh, yeah, man. And then there was kind of some, uh, some, some fist bumps going on. And we were all pretty excited that, uh, that he'd regain consciousness. Although I'm still pretty uh, trepidatious at this point because we're not out of the woods, right? We don't have an ambulance on scene. And we were there with him for another 20 minutes i'd wow. say 20 25 minutes before the ambulance responded yeah well praise god and absolutely way to go team and that's why of like that's why we preach medical all the time medical 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 of like everywhere we go we got medical stuff it just like we carry guns people don't understand of like right guns and medical really go together it's really that warrior poet i want to defend life and it's a gun helps me defend innocent life from bad guys and if bad guys shoot them up then, well, I can patch him back up. Medical, it's the exact same defender, protector, rescuer impulse. So 
medical everywhere. And that's why of like, I carry medical everywhere. And now given what has happened, I'm rethinking some stuff. And I felt very uncomfortable all weekend, uh, knowing that this happened, uh, because I don't feel like I have enough medical kit. And so, you know what I did the very next day, right? Ordered, ordered a couple of AEDs. I right? ordered three AEDs for us. So now when you're out uh, teaching part of the range trailer, you'll always have an AED in your classes. Uh, Josh as well, when he's, you know, leading whatever class he's teaching, he'll always have an AED and I got one for me too. And sure. so in 2023, what was never really a big problem and concern that we would carry that high dollar piece of equipment with us. Now it's nope, 2021 and 2022 people's sure people have been changed because foreign substances and now we carry AEDs everywhere right even even prior to 2023 it's kind of like every everything is okay till it's not right right and uh you know until you actually experience an event like that where you did not have a piece of equipment because we didn't have that AED if we weren't able to get that if it wasn't there if just by chance luck divine intervention whatever you believe in it, if we did not have that piece of equipment there, I don't believe we would have been able to bring him back. No, uh -huh. uh, that's that saved that saved his life. And I know you you know you and I talk about and anybody that's trained with me in the past couple of years, the Warrior Poet Society. I preach medical all the time in the classes. You know, when we do our medical brief, that's one of the things I kind of get on my soapbox a little bit and ask who has medical equipment. And we see a lot of IFACs and a lot of guys carrying medical right. equipment. And then I you know then I ask the question, okay, who has medical training? with right. the equipment that they have and then half the hands go down, uh, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. So you're like, okay, so everybody here has got some sort of, uh, has some, some medical equipment that they could use. Right. right. And, uh, but not as much training as there is equipment. Right. And so I kind of get up there and talk about how medical training is super important because the, the statistical probability here is that you're going to need medical training more often in your life than you're going to need your gunfighter training. Right? Yeah, and it's perishable too because of like I, I I went through EMT school and I got my EMT certificate and I, I did all kinds of in the military, you know uh, you don't you can do like open heart surgery on other soldiers sure. without any real fear of liability as just a mere EMT in Ranger Battalion. I wasn't a medic, I was a door kicker, but uh, because I had that EMT con skill, I was able to do whatever. So I'm like pushing fluids and giving IVs and giving people shots for altitude sickness up in, uh, you know, the foothills of the Hindu Kush and uh, Afghanistan and places of like, I got to do all kinds of crazy stuff. All right. So now that we've seen an event that we have not personally uh, dealt with previously, at least I haven't, uh, what are you doing different now? after this uh, post incident, what are you doing for now to be more prepared in terms of medical? Got it. Well, one thing is I just went to another medical class. We were rolling out our new medical classes before we had an amazing instructor who, I mean, 19 combat tours, special forces, medic, amazing. And he crushed it. Uh, but it was pretty heavy on kind of non-permissive environment context and uh, we wanted to go more of a civilian route and he moved on and is doing great things. But we have Pat, our new warrior poet medical instructor. We just attended his pilot course and it was phenomenal. And it was really aimed at the civilian stuff that we do. So I was surprised at some, how much I learned in a med one and med two class, right. because I'm like, I'm not exactly a med one student. Sure. And there I am in med one taking <laughs> furious notes and trying to act like, Oh, yeah, I knew that already. And I totally didn't know that, but I don't want to let Pat know. I'm like, Hey, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm learning a lot of stuff. I was learning. Yeah. I was learning. And so that was fantastic. And so yay for our medical classes. Love that. And we have more posting soon, oh, right? Absolutely. Um, but, uh, some of the crap that I carry of one, I, I want training first and foremost, but second, I want stuff. And I realize my stuff isn't good enough. Now I have my, uh, it, it was kind of more of an active killer bag and now it's like an emergency trauma bag. And so, uh, you mentioned, uh, breaching tools. I have this in case like a school ever had like locks on the door. I needed to get into something, maybe a range is locked and I don't want that range to be locked anymore. Really to cut some kind of medium ish padlock. This isn't going to work. I've already tried it. And so it's kind of tiny stuff or I could bash in a windshield, but it's some type of breaching extraction tool. And so I have it and I'm not really happy with this. I wonder if just uh, a sledge around the same size, it'd probably be better. And I think it would be, but uh, this is a placeholder for now. 
Um, I obviously bought us the AEDs. They'll be here soon and we'll be carrying those and we'll get uh, some more relevant training. Another kit that I added is one of these little CPR masks. And really, I think the, the, the bag mask, it'd be a little bit better. They're bulkier, but hey, I'm kind of, I don't care as much about slimming down whatever vehicle I'm driving, this bag or a bigger bag that'll replace it. I'll be ready to go, but I wanted some type of CPR mask, and sure. this isn't as good as the bag mask. But. Yeah, I've carried I've carried a CPR mask and a, a compatible BVM. It's a collapsible BVM. They actually yeah. make them collapsible. They're pretty small these days. Yeah. So you could get something that uh, probably is about the same size uh, just to accompany that mask if it's compatible with the mask. So. so I've got one of these in my EDC carry packs that goes everywhere with me, and also one of our medical kits that goes with it. And I carry the double uh, we do these clear so that you can immediately see the contents as you're fishing for them rather than, you know, before we Surprise. had all the IFACs of like, right. it's this ninja camouflaged, whatever, and you unzip it and then you have to figure it all out. And I'm like, nope, I can see everything while I'm unzipping. So it's going to save you some time and it's not going to cost as much as the, the big, whatever, but the contents are expensive. So I have a double and then I also have the triple. So, I mean, I got five tourniquets and two, uh, like five sets of chest seals, 10 chest seals. And so if I rolled up on a mass casualty event, I'm going to be able to rescue a good bit of people with this stuff. And so I have that. Some other stuff that I've added to the mix is glucose oral gel. Mm. Uh, I, there was a, a old man standing in front of me in line in the Honduras airport last year, and he just collapsed. And I mean, I, I so much so that I even caught him and laid him down. And it was amazing no one around me was helping. They they kind of just stared. Sure. They just stared until I'm, I'm, I'm getting people to, you know, uh, find a doctor or something. And nobody even spoke English around me as well. So I got to play this in Spanish. I think it's a normal, best I can. it's a normal human reaction when you see something like that, though. Most people are all of a sudden like, <gasps> you right. know, they like, uh, do I, do I invade this person's space? Do I touch them? Right. Or, you know, do I even, would I even know what to do once I put my hands on them kind of thing? You know, even people who will rush to somebody's aid, you know, it's the dog catching the car thing. Right. It's like, well, what do you do now? Right. You know? Well, anyway, you know, I, I put them in a recovery position. I'm checking vitals. I start, uh, loosening restrictive clothing and stuff. And I'm just, uh, basically what is wrong with this guy? I check in pulses. Uh, I, I'm, I've already got people getting doctors on the way, but people really just kind of look at it, but then they just walk around you in line and keep on going about their business. So I'm like, man, nobody's, but he ended up being a diabetic. Uh, and, uh, this would have been extremely helpful, but I didn't have anything like this. And when he's incapacitated, it's not like you can just shove Skittles down his throat. You got to have something that you take this and you rub it up all in the gums and stuff, uh, and that'll dissolve and, and give him the hit, but I didn't have that. And so this goes everywhere I go now. And so, and then with the AED as well, that's some good medical equipment that I'm going to have on me as well as, uh, get medical training. An ER and surgeon so, in one of our classes who built IFACs for people and gave them out as gifts, you know, and his and his whole theory behind it because he'd given to people and they'd say, "Well, I, I won't know what to do with this." He's like, "Yeah, but somebody else might." Yeah, that's right. Good. So good it it may be that hey, you're you're augmenting somebody's dwindling supply of medical equipment in a mass casualty type event, or somebody you know unfortunately didn't have their trauma kit with them when it was needed, but they had the training to use it. So you know, if nothing else, you could be like, "Here, here." this um and you know but it's kind of like hey you could be you can have all the training in the world on the range right but if you don't actually have that piece of equipment with you to use uh i think the two kind of definitely go hand in hand but i can see where it comes to medical that having equipment that you could provide somebody who knows how to use it perhaps better than you do isn't a bad idea so even if you don't know how to use medical equipment it's not a bad idea to have some in my opinion it's true. It's a good contingency. I'd still rather have the knowledge and skills 100%. rather than the gear, but I totally get it of like, even if you don't have the knowledge, the gear can actually be helpful of like that. You can be the best surgeon around, but if you don't have an AED in that yeah. and CPR is failing, you're cooked. So, and that's, and that's another thing I think, you know, especially in the, um, in the, tactical shooting community right most of us most of us are former military you know we've uh, we've got multiple deployments in combat zones and so we really have uh, we, we tend to have a very myopic view of medical training and it's and it's focused kind of solely on what our experience is IED blasts gunshot wounds things like that right um, and 
and so we we kind of lose sight of you know we come back home and we're we're in the United States and we kind of lose sight of what the what the what the highest probability is right and we talk AEDs and glucose right you know of like what the absolutely but that's what I'm dealing with all, I want to rescue not all the tourniquets in the world would not have saved that guy on Friday right yeah. uh, and we're you know everybody's like hey at least carry a tourniquet. Okay, we'll carry a tourniquet and a chest seal. Okay, carry a tourniquet, a chest seal, an MPA, and some combat gauze. You know, it, well, no, the triple IFAC even, you know, which again, when we go through our patient assessment, we know that massive hem hemorrhaging is kind of the first thing that you want to look at, right? So as you go through that patient assessment, um, it, you know, those things are important. Yeah. But this is where we have, we've identified kind of a deficiency in, in, our, in our medical equipment that we carry with us, whether, right. it's, whether it's to the range or it's, you know, on our person as we're uh, going about our daily lives. So oh, uh, last thing is... I'm carrying around a fire extinguisher. I didn't take it out of the box because I don't want it rolling around my back seat and yeah. boxes don't roll. Sure. Uh, and so I've got a little fire extinguisher ready to go in case I roll up on a vehicle that's in flames and I want to and then pull them out. And I don't know what pipe dream I'm going through. of like, I want a fire extinguisher. And so I got one of those in uh, my vehicle. But it, it's interesting how with the learning I'm doing uh, in medical courses, ongoing stuff, as I'm adapting to the the actual injuries that I see out there and trying to just be a good uh, warrior poet, a, a good protector and rescuer, how I am evolving and changing what I'm carrying. And so uh, guys in the comments, what else should I have as well? What, what, what have you done differently? And what'd you learn in this, uh, in this video as well? Uh, but uh, I am just... As we end this video, I'm thrilled that that student is still alive. That's a, that's a, that's a big deal, and I am pumped. I am, I'm thrilled uh, that oh, that yes. went. Uh, that this has turned into a success story rather than a oh I wish we had. So guys, thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, subscribe to the channel, like, comment, share all that good stuff. We appreciate you. Train hard, train smart, stay free. Today we are going to be training with Shuki Dre. Intercept and cut the muscle. Now that you understand what knife can do, now we can truly start the classes. One of the toughest guys I know. <laughs> well, he's able to do almost everything. You know? He's great with a knife. He was the guy who made me look like if I was a five-year-old kid when I moved with him. He, he can put you into a very deep pain. Ah, 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 ah. I, I know you guys are going to enjoy his masterclass.